I bring you greetings from uh, London. I was in the church in London. Uh, first, I was in Seattle, Washington. I was invited by Pastor Wendell Smith. Some of you may remember him. He was here during Yogi Cho's program. They invited me for a conference. So I was there. It was a good time. Seattle, the home of Bill Gates, Microsoft, Boeing, and um, we had a good time in the Lord. And I was also in London. Uh, in London, we had a powerful convention. We announced to the church that we had bought our church building there, our own cathedral, Lighthouse Cathedral, London. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, so um, we announced to the people and uh, we took them to the building to have a look at it in the night. Amen. And uh, they are doing some work on the building and then at a point we will dedicate it. We are praying that in many countries in the world there will be lighthouse buildings. Amen. Nine years ago, around this time, I went to London uh, to begin the church there. And uh, we thank the Lord that he has done a great work over there. There are many, many churches there. They are spreading outside London now into places like Nottingham, Birmingham, uh, Sheffield, Norwich, Manchester, and so on. And uh, the churches are really growing and really doing well. And uh, the Lighthouse churches in London also are growing. They are about to start many more churches. We want to have every one kilometer church. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you glad about that? A kilometer a church. Tell somebody a kilometer a church. Amen. And uh, we want to reach out and do what the Lord has called us to do as a church. God has not called us to be motivational speakers, but to be preachers of his word, to plant churches and disciple nations. And so that is what, exactly what we want to do. We are not politicians. We are preachers of the Bible. And we want to continue preaching the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So we want us all to be involved and to participate. Our building in London cost more than one million pounds. But by the grace of God, we've been able to pay for it. Amen. An Anglican church was selling their church. You know, they've sold their churches to discos, clubs, even mosques. I mean, they, they are all they are selling the church. God, nobody goes to church anymore. And so we bought one of them, and uh, we are turning it back into a church. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. So when you are in London, make sure you visit the Lighthouse Cathedral in London. Tell them that you are from the Cathedral in Accra, and you've come to the Cathedral in London. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Wonderful. So it is good to be back home. Um, there's no place like home. So it is good to be back. Tonight we have a miracle service. Try to be here. I believe that the Lord is going to bless us all. Amen. Amen. Today we are continuing on our series on the parables of prayer. All right. Let's read verse 1 of Luke 18. It says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God neither regarded man and there was a widow in that city and she came unto him saying avenge me of mine adversary and he would not for a while but afterward he said within himself though I fear not God nor regard man yet because this widow troubleth me I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, he shall he find faith on earth. Amen. And there was another parable of prayer right there below. It says, And he spake this parable unto 
certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. And the Pharisee stood thus with himself and said, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess, and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, Jesus uh, had several parables, and some of them were about prayer. I just read two of these prayer parables. All right. And um, the first lesson I want us to learn from the first parable is about the widow and the judge. Uh, Jesus likens the person who comes in prayer often to a widow. Amen. Now, in those days, uh, women did not work the way they work today. You know, usually these days, if you are married, you will find out that the husband works in some place or other, and the wife also has a job, right? But in those days, you know, you know the women were basically waiting for their husbands to uh, care for them. They would stay at home, and um, their husbands would, what do you call it, uh, provide for them. And that's why when they were counting people, they didn't count the women and the children. Is that not so? They would always count, say, besides women and children, 5,000 were saved, besides women and children, 3,000 were saved, besides women and children, you know? So it was like the women were not really counted. But thank God you are counted in Christ. Amen. Now, this woman being a widow put her in a very difficult situation. No income, no help, no support, no livelihood. And how does she survive? This is really the picture that Jesus is trying to show us of someone who prays. Someone who prays and spends time with God is like a widow who has no one to help him or her and does not know of any source of help apart from God. In fact, until you become like a widow, you know, in your thinking. And when I say a widow, I'm not talking about the modern widows who also have jobs and sources of livelihood. I'm talking about the widows of the Bible times. Until you become like, like a widow in your mind and in your heart, you will never really pray much. Amen. Because it takes humility to pray. It takes a certain level of desperation a certain level of having no one and no other source. Why don't we often pray for healing in today's world? Why is it that many people, even pastors, we don't often pray for people to be healed? To pray for people to be healed almost looks frivolous, unnecessary, an extra addition which can be done without, something which even people despise. They listen to their testimonies and they say, oh, this is not real. And not just Christians, but pastors. Because we have other sources of healing today. Malaria can be cured 
very well. Fever can be cured very well and very easily by buying what? Chloroquine. Chloroquine is still being used. Is it still being used? Chloroquine is still working. I'm surprised that it still works, but it's still working. By now, the mosquitoes should have evolved, or the malaria parasite should have evolved into some really resistant uh, species. I'm sure they are, but chloroquine still has an effect. And why pray when you can take chloroquine? You've got a headache. Why pray when you can take paracetamol or alagbin? Or what? Huh? Akobam. Does Akobam cure headaches? No, but Akobam cures everything. And once I was buying petrol, and there was a man who was selling me. I asked him, tell me what exactly this thing cures. He said it cures piles. It cures impotence. It cures what, stomach ulcer. It cures so many aspects. I said, are you sure? He said, I'm sure. So we sat powerful potions in the world today. There is almost no need for prayer. So once there is a strong alternative, people don't pray. Even pastors, why pray when you can preach and shout and people will be impressed? Why pray when you can advertise? Why pray when you can go and talk to some rich man to give you money to do the work of God? Why pray when no one knows when you don't pray? Or why pray when, when you haven't prayed and when you have prayed, there doesn't seem to be any difference? Why pray? Until you become like a widow in your mind and your heart where you have no hope and you have no help apart from God and you believe that you have no hope and you have no help apart from God. Until you become like that, you will never really pray much. That's why Jesus used the example of a widow. But a widow who went to an unjust judge. And many of us here, you see, that is why as you get richer, and as you get more powerful and more successful, prayer becomes less. If we have a strange prayer meeting here on Friday evening, or I say there's a prayer meeting, you'll find more poorer people, more less successful people, will arrive here for the prayer meeting. The richer you are, the, when, you have, when you are richer, or when you are more successful in life, or whatever, you have solutions and answers and alternatives. So prayer is one of the last things you think about doing. So you need to grow in your heart. You see, God doesn't need to take these things away from us before we become like widows in our hearts. God doesn't need to strip us of what we have before we realize that prayer is like coming before God as though you are a widow. Prayer is like coming before God as though you are, you are, you are helpless, hopeless. And, you, and hopeless and helpless, yet with major burdens and life ahead. How will you survive? How will you make it? Except God. Many widows will say, God, by the grace of God. When the widow is saying, by the grace of God, it's different from when some of you are saying, by the grace of God. You're by the grace of God. It's like some kind of jargon. It's like, you know, oh yeah, you know. By his grace, I mean, Adam, you know, we'll see it's going to work. But when a widow is saying, by the grace of God, I have survived these last three years. It's different from when you are saying, oh, by the grace of God, I mean, we are making it, you know. How is your business? Oh, by his grace. By his grace. It's different from when a widow is saying, by his grace. Yeah. Very different. Yeah. Until a pastor becomes like a widow in his heart. A widow is someone who has lost earthly hopes. Earthly alternatives, human alternatives to making it. And it, the focus is now God is now my alternative to making it. Until you become like a widow in your heart, you will never pray like Jesus expects us to pray. And God does not need to take away from us everything that we have before we come and start bowing our knees and praying three times a day. But you see people who pray. Some people, if they didn't have marital problems, they wouldn't pray. 
Come on now. I said some people, if they didn't have marital problems, they wouldn't pray at all. Their prayer life is strong because of their marriage. And so sometimes that's why God will give you a very beastly person to cause you, to drive you to spirituality. Some people, if you couldn't have, if it wasn't that you couldn't have a child, and there would be no prayer in your life. Oh yeah. If it wasn't set, certain things that you are going through or you have been through, you wouldn't bow your knees before him. Because there are certain things that get to a place where you are like a widow. There's no hope. There's no help. There's no source. It's only God who can help you. When you say by his grace, you mean by his grace, I am surviving. That's what you mean. Pastors, I have come to see. You see, my, I've noticed that my church grows when I lose hope in myself. When I've tried everything and nothing is working. And all my efforts are not working. And I have done everything I can do. And it is not working. Then it starts to work. Because then I've become like a widow without any earthly human alternative or hope. And God now says, yes, I'm going to take over and I'm going to help you and I'm going to bless you. Do you want God to strip you and take away your life and your health? A lot of us here don't pray. Let the doctor tell you you have this and this disease and you are going to die. We'll see you. When we, when we say there's a, it's a prayer meeting for your chapel, you wouldn't just... Throw it away. No. You would think about it. I, I have to be there. I'll be there, on, I'll be there on Friday. I'll be there on Saturday. I'll be there on Sunday. I'll be there in the morning. I'll be there in the evening because I'm dying. Oh, brother, I've, I'm a pastor. It's my work. My work is life and death. I've, seen, I've had people telling me I'm dying. I've had people telling me that I'm dying. I'm going to die. It changes people. It changes. Our pride goes because now there's nothing. I mean, nobody can help. Nothing can help. I'm dying. Oh, it changes people. Do you want God to make you into a widow in reality before you will now bow your knees and become a person of prayer? Jesus said that there was a certain widow and an unjust judge. You see, it is just the picture of a widow, of a person who has no hope. That is the picture of a person who is in prayer. All those who have everything, they often do not pray much. It is said that, I read an article, 80% of pastors pray 10, is it 15 minutes a day? 15 minutes, the maximum prayer of pastors. 80% of all pastors, that was in America, is they pray 15 minutes a day. 80%, almost, almost all pastors don't pray. 15 minutes a prayer, 15 minutes a prayer, that is... That is, that is what we were praying when we were in secondary school, when we were backslidden, when we were backslid, when you are backslidden in secondary school scripture unit, that's when you pray for 15 minutes. Because <laughs> the church works. Because people need churches, so they come to church anyway. Almost all churches are almost full. Christmas time, even pastors who are demon-possessed, their churches are full. Pastors who are not born again Christians, their churches are full. Pastors who are not Christians, their churches are full with canopies outside. And, and they don't pray. But God is calling us to that place where we will actually see ourselves as people without hope except God. That thing when we say by, by his grace is true. I remember somebody was dying and he got up and said, <laughs> but you, you may shout or you may stand or you may do whatever, but if you are dying, you will die. You will die. When it's time to die, you die. Even if you don't want to die. I've heard many times of people who didn't want to die as they were dying, but they died. I don't want to go, but you go. That's what they're going there. When it's time to go, you go. Because by his grace alone, you are alive. Even if you are very rich, even if you are abroad like Princess Diana, if it's time to die, you just die. You may be in a bulletproof car, but you will still die. 
when it's time to die. So by his grace, it's true, but we don't believe it. That's why we don't pray much. But we are going to begin to pray. And we are going to begin to pray in the church. Many of us use Sunday service as a house of, a house of fashion. Church has become a house of fashion, not a house of prayer. Huh? I said the church has become a house of fashion instead of a house of prayer. You invite people to church. I don't have, I don't have a, 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 a dress. I don't have shoes like your shoes. I don't have a hat like your hat. Like I can't come to church. What a shame. We become a house of fashion. If you, if you don't have different dresses, different shoes, you, you, you can't come. I wore that last week. Perhaps that is why at these days as I watch the television, I'm seeing more and more churches where the pastors are wearing T-shirts. Perhaps I have to start wearing T-shirts for you to know that. It is not by tie or by suit. One day a missionary went to a village and he stayed there for some time and as he preached, people got converted and so on and he began to show them how to dress, they should wear a tie, suit, and so on, and come to church. And one day, uh, someone came to the village and was asking, you know, uh, how, do you be, how do you become a Christian? I mean, what, 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 what are these people? He said, oh, if you wear a suit, and then you wear a tie, then you become a Christian. Because all the Christians, they wear a suit and they wear a tie. You see, you become a Christian before you start wearing a suit and a tie. The suit and the tie is not the Christianity. It happens that that is commonly associated with the Christian, but that's not what makes you a Christian. Do not let our dressing mislead people. We are to be a house of prayer. Now when we come to church on Sundays, you know, for us to pray, for us to sing and, and you know, to pray, and, and it looks sometimes even funny. The one who is leading cry, you feel that he's... You know, when you are leading, sometimes you, are, you, are, you feel more tense because of the people. Because the people look like you are doing something wrong. No, I'm serious. It's like, what are you doing? You are spoiling the service. You are spoiling the church. How can we spoil a church? By prayer. Wake up. Sleep not when I'm preaching. Okay? Sleep not when I'm preaching. If you sleep, I'll call you. I don't care who you are. I'm telling you. All right. So we are going to pray. Stand up. Let's pray. Do you know what we are going to do? We are going to pray that, Lord, can I have uh, whoever is there? You know, we are going to pray that, Lord, give me that humility. Let me not trust myself. Don't trust yourself, oh. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Let us become widows in our hearts when it comes to the Lord. Lift up your hands and just commit yourself to God. I want us to pray and I want to pray that we will get to the place where we, we trust in the Lord. We are depending on the Lord. We are relying on the Lord. Our hope is in God, not in our strength or in our efforts. But our hope is in the Lord. Shandala babanda rada babanda rada babanda rada babanda. Miso kandala marile shere belende. Oh God, take away the prayerlessness. Take away the prayerlessness. Take away the prayerlessness. Prayerlessness in my life. Moda saka marono mo shibala mamande rebele bele du swendele kramalande 
Jesus, 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 Jesus. Mandon Sandala Maman. Mandola Momo Cabora Lava Dava Lava Dava Lava Dava Lava 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 Lava